All right, you guys. Welcome. Happy to have everybody here. I'm not sure if people will join, but uh, um, I don't know if we've had the conversation yet, but this is kind of intended to be just something that you can participate in if you're available, but it's also something that's going to be recorded and available to you later. So if, um, if as we'll add people as they kind of join on, and it seems like everybody here has used Zoom before, so there's not really any instruction to kind of go through. Um, there's the chat if you want to chat or just unmute yourself and say some words if you want to. So um, really this, this, is, this is the first time that we're doing uh, the, the virtual class for the new wine club, which is super exciting just because it allows us to kind of see each other without being with each other, which, you know, COVID and all is a good thing. So you can kind of see the agenda here on the screen. Um, there's a couple of housekeeping things that I want to talk about as it pertains to uh, Wine Club and how to access uh, the, the video and the text sheet. So in, <coughs> in the box that you received should be something that, let me go over here. Um, if you did the, the, three, the three wines, not all red, but the mix, um, you should have three text sheets that came in your box. And in, and in the bottom corner is a QR code that came... Uh, with each printout. If you scan that QR code, it's going to take you to the Venovium website where there is a digital copy of this uh, also with the video uh, that we're creating today. So essentially what's going to happen is uh, we're going to do this class and then I'm going to take apart the sections about Viognier and the Ocotillo and the, and the Cab Franc and then those video portions will live independently um, according to the wine on the website. And so what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna share my screen with you. Uh, that way you know how to access that just in case um, you throw these away, which if you do, recycle them. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen and then uh, we'll kind of jump into uh, topics that we're gonna talk about and follow the agenda. But before we do that, I wanna show you, I wanna make sure you understand uh, how to get to the information about the wine and everyone, you know, there's been a lot of comments about the website. The website eventually will, will be changing to better reflect kind of the, where Venovium is and where it's going. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen at the moment. I'm gonna pull up a website. Pull up Venovium. <clears throat> Okay, so what, what I did just temporarily until we figure out the best place for this to live is if you, either way, whether you go to uh, wines, there's now a new drop down for wines called wine releases, or if you get to it from the wines here in the main navigation bar and you click on that, it'll say wine releases. And here are basically the three wines that we're talking about today. And the video, like I'm saying, the video coming soon will be based off of the video that we're creating today. So that video will live here based off of that topic that we're gonna talk about. So if you click on download text sheet, it'll basically take you to the exact same thing that you got in your shipment. And then you could download that, whatever you wanna do. You could share it, uh, whatever. So that'll live forever on the website. And then we'll kind of just add on as we as we go through the years here. Um, oh, oh, and then I, the other thing I was gonna say is, uh, let, let's say you go to wines and you don't go to wine releases, eventually what's gonna end up happening is all the wines that are currently on the website <clears throat> uh, will have the same information. So if you go to the product page for each individual wine, uh, that information will eventually also live on this page or there'll be a link to that information. So you should be able to get to the text sheet information for every release going forward from the individual product page or from the, the, the wine release page. And the wine release page again is wines, wine releases, super simple. All right, you guys, so we're gonna go through three wines. Here was, I sent out an email obviously with the login information and to, to get, kind of get 
into the Zoom meeting, but part of that email was also kind of what's the expectation for these virtual classes? I, I, it's not fair for us to ask you to open every single wine that we release for these classes. And I know that when COVID round one happened, um, that a lot of the wineries were doing virtual classes and virtual tastings, and they would send you three, four, five wines. And the expectation was to open all those wines to participate in the tasting. I don't expect you to do that. Even if you don't want to drink the wines, um, this is really meant to create content that can be accessed in the future. If you want to open all three wines, fantastic. We're going to taste all three wines, or at least I'm going to walk you through my tasting of all three wines. We're going to talk about the, kind of the context behind each wine, but really it's not intended for you to, um, unless you want to, again, uh, open all three wines just because uh, we're doing a virtual class. So that being said, if, 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 uh, if you are drinking wines today or one of the wines that came in the shipment, we may all be drinking different wines. I'm going to start with the Viognier. Uh, feel free to join me if that wine is open for you. If not, just open something, drink something, even if it's scotch, because if I weren't doing this, I'd probably be drinking scotch also. All right. And um, we're gonna, let's go ahead and start. So we have an agenda for the day. I did want to welcome everybody. There is an introduction about Viognier. We'll do an uh, a little, you know, a little um, background on Viognier, kind of the history of Viognier, the lineage of Viognier, kind of varietal characteristics. We'll talk about high, <coughs> high cross vineyard specifically, which is where this Viognier comes from. Um, Erica and Cam Campbell are the owners of High Cross uh, Vineyard, and they tried to join us today, but they're unable because they are harvesting this Viognier that we're drinking uh, tonight so that uh, we can press it tomorrow. And I'll be actually going over to West Cape Cellars tomorrow to press Viognier. And obviously, if you hear Nacho in the background, it's because he insists on being a part of every single class that I do. Um, and I apologize. <laughs> He's, he, he has his moments of being hangry. And I think this may be one of the moments. Um, so then we'll actually talk about uh, to kind of follow up the, or finish the Viognier section, we'll, we'll look, I'll, I, when I was in Condru, uh, the Northern Rhone uh, several years back, 2016, which I miss so dearly, um, we'll look at a video that I created that is kind of, so you can see the terrain and the topography of where the home of Viognier comes from. And then we'll do an introduction about Ocotillo, like why the name Ocotillo? What's the history of that brand? Uh, kind of what's the makeup of the brand, of the wine in the 2018 vintage? And really what's the style of wine based off of, which is this idea of a super Tuscan and what's the history behind super Tuscan. Um, and then we'll finish with the Cabernet Franc. Obviously this is a non-Texas wine. So it's important for us to talk about why we produce non-Texas wines. And also kind of from there, we'll talk about the varietal characteristics, the, the winery partnership that we have in Lodi to produce this wine. And then we'll finish with a little bit of Q&A if you have any questions. And then uh, we'll talk about the next round of public virtual classes with Mark Rayshap. And I did an interview with him uh, yesterday and I'll show you that video. So you can meet Mark and then we'll talk about the classes uh, that we're gonna be featuring in the next three classes, virtual wine classes starting in August. All right, you guys, so let's talk about Viognier. Um, let's first talk about kind of, the, let's do a tasting. If you're doing a tasting with Viognier, let's talk about it. Obviously, when you pour the wine in the glass, it has a super unique color. And uh, that color is virgin on gold, virgin on canary, maybe some amber hues to it. But it is what you would call a darker white wine for sure. So when you see colors of this, you have to immediately start to ask yourself the question, why is it that color of yellow? And really there's only two options and, or two options plus an exception. And this wine is both, both options plus the exception. And the two options are the wine has been an oak and the wine has been uh, oxidized. Uh, and three, the third option, which is the exception is that it's one of our aromatic varietals, which is dark in color in the first place, which is Viognier. So when we talk about color of white wine, anytime you see this color in a wine, or color that is uh, kind of to the right or more gold than gold, gold, canary, amberish colors. These are all wines that you have to automatically step back and think, okay, why is that wine that color? And it can really only be three options. Either it's been oaked, it's been oxidized, or it's been uh, from a varietal that is uh, uniquely high in color, high in tannin, high in phenolics like, like Viognier. 
particularly grapes that have thicker skins, like Roussan, like Marsan, like Viognier, like a Verstraminer. These are all wines that tend to give a little bit more color in the wine. And then when you add your production technique, they become even, even more golden color. So we're looking at a, uh, at a Viognier, and I, I will say, let's, in terms of how this wine was produced, uh, it is 100% Viognier, but this wine was barrel fermented. 20% of it was barrel fermented, and you're getting a lot of that kind of overripe golden character as a result of that, and that is a new French oak. And then the other 80% was stainless steel fermented, and then the wine aged on lees for a good, you know, uh, eight to 10 months before it was eventually racked, fined, uh, or, or racked, filtered, then kegged. Um, so it is not unusual to get Viognier's that are this dark. The question is, when you see wines that are this color, is once you get to the flavor profile and the aromatic profile, how much, how pronounced are they? And I would expect this wine to be more pronounced on the, on the aromas and on the palate than what we'll find. But the reality is, is that we have a, a pretty robust Viognier just based off of color. If you have the tech sheet in front of you, the one that came uh, with your wines, <clears throat> you'll notice that the alcohol content here is 15%. So I'm looking at a, at a pretty boozy Viognier. And for us, it's all about balance. So if I have a 15% alcohol by volume Viognier, is it in balance with the rest of the wine? The rest of the wine has to be comprised of, of its aromatic profile, its texture, its, its phenolic character, meaning its tannin, its acid profile, and then kind of the overall body or weight of the wine. So pretty high in alcohol wine, 100% Viognier, barrel fermented, or at least 20% barrel fermented, and new French oak. Um, kind of going through the rest of the tech sheet here, we have a pH of 3.6, which is ideal for, <laughs> ideal for a red wine, uh, a little bit high for a white wine, but the reality is, is Viognier's that are kind of in this fuller bodied range tend to be uh, red wines or white wines disguised as red wines. So I'm not scared by that pH. The total acidity is, is, is what I would expect, kind of middle of the tier. Um, and nothing else really, really stands out. So uh, let's give it a whirl, give it a smell. Viognier is one of these varietals that is highly aromatic. It's, it's one of these varietals that in a blind tasting tends to give you a lot of tangerine, a lot of white flowers, a lot of kind of exotic spice. Uh, think of saffron, think of uh, ginger, think of uh, things that are in that realm. And the question is, one, in terms of intensity, how intense is it? Is it giving me the correct varietal character that I'm looking for? Uh, honeycomb, tangerine, it's more on the the orange citrus than it is on the lemon and lime citrus character. And the fact that it's 15% alcohol by volume is an indication of the growing season. Um, one of the other notes on this text sheet is that the grapes were harvested in, in kind of late July. Obviously for the 2020 vintage, the grapes are being harvested tomorrow. Um, in, in the world of Texas Viognier, mid to late July is kind of the window. So the late July, we're producing riper styles of Viognier, which is definitely what we're getting. And so when you smell this wine, in terms of the character of the fruit on the aroma, uh, it's definitely riper, juicier, a little bit more aromatic, but it's not over the top. There is a restraint to this wine that is super fascinating. And uh, which is why I, I, I'm really enjoying this wine, mainly because I feel that the, the, the yield, the half acre or the half ton per acre is creating a lot of concentration on the palate uh, without being over the top cooked or baked or stewed uh, or candied. It's just quite pleasant on the nose without being uh, overly aromatic, which makes you want to, you know, it's interesting. It makes you want to keep drinking and consuming. Yeah, I mean, there, there is layers of flavor, a lot of sophistication. I mean, once we get to the palate and we figure out, okay, if you haven't tasted, if you are tasting this wine, you haven't tasted it yet, go ahead and taste it. But the wine in terms of its overall texture is pretty rich. It's almost kind of oily like, um, which is creating a nice rich mouthfeel, but then it's got incredible acid that just washes all that away combined with the alcohol that creates a lot of balance. So going back to this idea of 
15% alcohol by volume as a high alcohol wine, I mean, this is higher than most red wines, particularly in Texas. But it, it holds it, it holds it well. It's like a, um, it's like a, a big guy that is able to fit into skinny jeans or something. <laughs> you know, there's just a lot of uh, enough there to keep the alcohol in check so that it doesn't feel hot. I mean, the wine. If you were to ask me, does the wine feel hot? I would say no. It's actually really pleasant in terms of its acid. It's got good body. It's got good weight. Uh, and then the flavors are are spot on. I mean, we're kind of getting a little bit ripe tangerine, a little bit of this overripe, fleshy kind of nectarine peach, uh, apricot character, whatever you want to call that. Um, and then this really pretty kind of yellow honey flower, honeysuckle character that really stands out. Um, so a little bit more about this wine in terms of, of, of the vineyard, <coughs> uh, High Cross Vineyard. Uh, Eric, uh, or excuse me, Erica and Cam Campbell are the, the founders of High Cross Vineyard. The vineyard was planted in 2010. Uh, there's about 40 acres. The vineyard is famous for really four main varietals, Viognier, Sangiovese, uh, Tempranillo, and Syrah. And so those of you that have, know us, which pretty much everybody on the, on the, on the class today knows, uh, has been familiar with Vinovi for a while, uh, you know that we do a lot of work with Alan Fetty at West Cave Cellars and with William Chris. And so uh, of the four varietals, all four varietals go to those two winery, wineries. Uh, West Cape Cellars does the Viognier and the Sangiovese, and then William Chris gets the Tempranillo and the Syrah. Um, and we love the way that Alan handles Viognier, mainly because he does this partial barrel fermentation, which is sometimes classic in the home of Viognier, which is uh, Condru, France, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Uh, <coughs> um, but it, he, he likes this a little bit richer uh, style of Viognier. And every year we try to push him to, yes, continue to do the yolk treatment, but also don't let it kind of over extract itself so it becomes highly aromatic and slightly cloying. We want that Viognier to be really fresh on the palate and that's ultimately the classic style. Uh, it is not unusual in Viognier for the grapes to be on the vine longer uh, than what you would expect, um, mainly to just create ripeness. It is a varietal that, it, while it is early ripening, it also tends to be a varietal that can hang on the vine longer. And so you do see kind of sweet, almost dessert style wines of Viognier around the world, particularly in Australia, uh, where they make a lot of the sticky wines, uh, also known as their dessert wines out of Viognier. Uh, you can also see kind of the sweeter style wines produced in France, but that's really based off of the given vintage. All right, you guys. So a uh, couple of things about Viognier that I wanted to share that are related to um, the, varietal, the varietal itself. So I'm gonna pull up some images here. So there's a grape leaf, there's a grape cluster of Viognier. Not, I mean, more so so you can see it and know what it looks like, but I don't expect you to remember that, but it's, it's nice to know, know what things look like in the vineyard. And so to kind of give you an idea about Viognier from around the world, um, Viognier going into the 1970s was almost an extinct varietal. In the 1960s, there was only 13 uh, acres of Viognier globally planted. Uh, and it's had a, and a major resurgence since the 1990s and going into the 2000s. And there's one producer uh, that's, that has really kind of created the situation where Viognier has not gone extinct. And that's a producer named George Vernet. And I'll type it here in the chat. Very hard to hear, Craig. George... Vernet. And George Vernet uh, passed away two years ago, but George Vernet is considered the father, the grandfather or the father or the whatever patriarch of Viognier. Um, Chateau George Vernet in Condru uh, was, the, was the winery and the person that actually took this varietal and dedicated his life to it and actually propagated it 
to the point where it has become now a world-class varietal uh, and planted all over the world. So to kind of give you an idea, since 1960, where there was only 13 acres of Viognier planted, Texas today has about 180 acres of Viognier planted, and it's on an increasing trend. So every year you tend to see more plantings of Viognier planted. Um, this is kind of a, um, I didn't want to go into too much detail about Texas wines. Uh, we will do some classes on Texas wines in October. All the virtual classes uh, we'll be doing, or rather all the in-person classes that we'll be doing here at Venovium will be kind of Texas and the history of Texas wine and the future of Texas wine. So uh, I don't want to spend too much time talking about Texas wines if it doesn't relate to the wine. But as of 2018, or excuse me, 2019, the USDA uh, uh, report about terms of total tonnage and total acreage in Texas. We're sitting at about 5,000 acres of total planted grapes with about 5,000 bearing acres and about 200 non-bearing acres that are coming online. Uh, it seems that every year we tend to increase a little bit, uh, but right now the, the actual numbers are a little bit about, a little around 5,000, a little bit more than 5,000 with about 180 acres of Viognier. In California, uh, which, you know, California has a, a significant amount of Viognier planted in it, uh, right around 2,600 acres uh, is really kind of a fraction of what we see around the world. Australia has about 3,500 acres. And then in France, where the home of Viognier is, we see about 13,000 uh, acres of Viognier planted. So not a ton in terms of a global perspective, but enough to keep the varietal alive and it's become one of these things that in the world of the sommelier is a testable varietal because it is incredibly unique to itself. There's nothing else that drinks like a Viognier. However, there are th grapes that kind of parallel a Viognier or a lateral to a Viognier. And sometimes you'll hear, you'll go into a tasting room and people will talk about Viognier as the Chardonnay of Texas. Um, it has a lot of similarities to Chardonnay, both in terms of body but really nothing in terms of Chardonnay in terms of its fruit character. Uh, Chardonnay tends to be more apple pear, lemon. Uh, and again, Viognier tends to be a little bit more tropical, more floral, more honeyed. Um, and obviously a, a, a total shift in acid and texture of wine. <coughs> Excuse me. The other kind of comparison you get to Viognier is uh, Gewürztraminer. Gewürztraminer kind of being this rich kind of oily style wine, texturally is similar. But Gewürztraminer is entirely a different uh, kind of aromatic and flavor profile. You get a lot more ginger, a lot more spice. Uh, Gewürztraminers tend to really hold their uh, sweetness well uh, and tend to be a little bit higher in acid. Um, Viognier's tend to be some of these wines that you will taste and classify as fruity and therefore some of these wines that you will give to somebody and they will call them sweet. The wine is 100% dry, it's just, it's a riper style with more intensity of fruit, and therefore people will call that uh, slightly sweet. Um, in terms of the vineyard, uh, Viognier tends to be, uh, like I said, an early ripening varietal. <coughs> Excuse me. An early ripening varietal. It's low yielding. It does have some problems, mainly that it is low yielding naturally, but also it is uh, susceptible to um, certain issues in terms of its ripening, which is, let me, it's not the right picture. There we go. Um, uh, Couleur, uh, which is this idea that uh, it's a, a condition totally based off of the environment in the given year where the, the, if we think, if the, if the flowers then become the fruit, Calor is a situation where the flower never gets fertilized and therefore the flower never becomes the fruit. Uh, Viognier tends to have, uh, um, I, don't, I don't know, I guess prone to this, where you will see certain vines uh, not actually get fertilized in the early spring or the mid spring, and therefore they actually won't produce a cluster. And that actually affects the overall yield. Other than that, um, because it is a thicker skin varietal, it tends to be resistant to a lot of the, the, the mold and mildew issues, the other types of disease pressures that we see in certain climates, particularly those humid type of climates, which is why it does so well for the central Texas. Um, 
you'll see some proponents that will say, well, what about Marsan and Rusan? <coughs> Rusan in particularly uh, is a varietal that ripens slightly sooner than Viognier. So it is a grape varietal, or excuse me, it ripens at the same time as Viognier, but it ripens, uh, it's not as early ripening. So whereas Viognier will bud break in, you know, second to third week of uh, April going into May, um, Roussan kind of misses that window and therefore misses early frost. Uh, and so what we tend to see is a little bit more Roussan planted here in the hill country than we do Viognier. And obviously because it's the more popular varietal in the state for white wines, uh, you tend to see quite a bit of Viognier planted in the high plains. And then in terms of soil, it likes sandy soils, uh, things that are uh, loose, well-drained, nothing that's a little bit, no dark soils, nothing loamy, nothing granite-like. It likes sandy clay-based, limestone-based soils, which is very prevalent here in the hill country and around Texas. Okay, and then uh, to kind of go back to this idea of the vineyard, <coughs> to show you where High Cross Vineyard is. <coughs> High Cross Vineyard is in West Texas. It's considered West Texas and in, in and around Sonora, Texas. And if you know kind of the growing areas that define or the areas that define the Texas Hill Country, um, let me show this image, maybe it's a little bit clearer. Um, Okay, so here's Sonora. There's the grape cluster. Junction is basically just east of Sonora. And so when we talk about the Texas Hill Country, the Texas Hill Country as a growing area is really defined by uh, the growing area between North San Antonio, west of Austin, east of Junction, and south of San Saba. Uh, and so we have this square um, that really is, was the original drawing area for uh, the Texas Hill Country. And what do we mean by that? Well, what we mean by that is kind of elevation anywhere between 900 and 1400 feet above sea level and kind of this limestone based rocky kind of sandy soil. Uh, and we kind of see, do, see that throughout the Hill Country, depending on where you are based off of your elevation. As we kind of move past junction, uh, the, the elevation increases. So we're talking about elevation anywhere between uh, 1900 and uh, 2300 feet above sea level. So we have an increase in elevation and we get a lot more rocky soil uh, as opposed to kind of sandy clay loam soils that we get in the hill country. I'm not saying that that sandy clay loam soil is not in far west Texas. It's there, but the top soil is, is a lot thinner or shorter and there, you don't get that as a kind of the, the main characteristic. You tend to get uh, very loose, rocky soils as opposed to kind of loamy clay-based soils that you get in the hill country and in the high plains. So when we talk about High Cross Vineyard, it is in terms of, which is why on the text sheet it's called Texas instead of Texas Hill Country, is that High Cross Vineyard technically does not sit within a AVA. It sits within the larger growing area that we call Texas, but it is not within the Texas, within a, one of the eight sub AVAs of Texas. However, because it is a vineyard appellated wine, vineyard appellated wines means that 95% or more of the fruit came from that vineyard. And so in this case, we have 100% Viognier from uh, High Cross Vineyard. And I'll pull up this other map just so you can see the comparison <laughs> or at least where it sits uh, throughout the state. So West Texas, West Texas will really basically be, be, be defined by uh, El Paso all the way to Junction and kind of a rectangle all the way down to the Mexico border, all the way through Chihuahua and El Paso, even though Chihuahua, Mexico is not part of a Texas growing area. If you guys have any questions as we go, just chime in and then uh, we'll answer. Okay. <clears throat> so I did not, you know, this is not a class on France. This is really kind of specific towards our Viognier, but I did want to show a video of 
the home of Viognier, which is the, the appellations of Ampuy and the village of Condru. And uh, this was a, a video, I'm gonna share my screen again. This was a video taken, I think 2016. Sometimes I forget. Okay, hopefully, hopefully the screen is still shared. You see, you see my screen. Let me delete some of this stuff. Make it smaller. Okay. So when we talk about Viognier in France, we're talking about the Rhone Valley, the Rhone Valley in southeastern France, but the northern portion of Viognier. And this does have audio, it's just music, so there's no talking, but it gives you a visual of what the region of of Ampuy and the Cote Roti looked like. There's two, very, two famous kind of hills in the region, one called the Cote de Brune, and one called the Cote de Blonde. On the Blonde Hill is where they're planting Viognier. And I am actually in a car in this video, driving on the Cote de Brune, and you'll see the hills adjacent to me, which are Viognier. Everything else you see is Syrah. And we'll talk about, uh, we'll wrap up with the kind of this conversation about the relationship between Syrah and Viognier. So here we go. Not sure what this red writing is, but there you go. So the, the village, if you can still hear me, the village underneath uh, is the town of, of Ampuy. And these are the hills of the Cote Roti. And then right next to Ampuy is the village of Condru, which is the home of Viognier. It becomes less dizzy here in a minute. <laughs> if you can look, the, you see the trellising system is completely different. It's almost like teepee-like. Um, that's Syrah. Syrah is one of these varietals that tends to kind of just, as it grows, uh, becomes falls on itself. So it needs to be trellised in such a way where it can be staked and tied down to posts uh, on either on, on a three-dimensional way. Those are all Viognier vines that you're seeing that are actually in a, in a traditional trellis system. So the topography in uh, the home of Viognier is completely different than what we see in the hill country. I mean, still dramatic hills. Um, this is relatively a cooler climate considering where what we know of. But still lime, limestone based soils kind of sandy cloy, uh, uh, sandy loam soils. And basically everywhere where you can't build a building or you can't farm some land, you put a vine. And so these are slopes that are anywhere between 50 and 60 degree slopes, extreme slopage. Kind of intense. Uh, this was, uh, I was here the day of bud break. So this is mm, April 20th through May 1st time frame. So Chapoutier, a very famous producer. Igugal, a very famous producer. And one of the things as we make this turn to the right, the vineyard on the left, the Igugal producer, is uh, natural production in terms of how it's farmed. And then the Chapoutier vineyard, if you notice, was much more green, much more fertile. That was a biodynamic vineyard. So biodynamic vineyards uh, tend to be a little bit greener 
uh, through the growing season. Cherry tree, very classic tree that you find in the region, kind of just budding out for the very first time. And then basically you go down the Cote de Brune and you end up in Ampuy, which is the, the village for Kandru, or the village adjacent to Kandru. I don't know if you saw all that. <laughs> I hope so. I don't know. We'll pretend. Okay. Okay, and then the last thing to talk about, I found this really amazing website um, that's about the lineage of varietals. And it was super complicated, but uh, the genealogy of a varietal is probably some of the most complex genealogy. Let me go back to sharing my screen so you see what I'm talking about. Okay, this is, uh, if you just Google genealogy of wine, this will pop up as one of your options. But this is uh, research that took a year and a half to do. And it's basically showing how grapes are related to each other. And to kind of save you some anxiety here, let me zoom in and I'll show you where Viognier is. Okay, here's Cabernet Franc. We'll come back to Cabernet Franc here in a minute. Uh, here's Viognier. Viognier in the top right. Um, let me zoom in some more. Oh, shoot. This website actually sells this map, which is super fascinating. Okay, Viognier. Hopefully everyone can see this. Um, if you participated in Julia's class, uh, we had a grape called Rebo. Rebo was a kind of a crossing between Merlot and Terra Delgo, which is up here. I don't know why I'm saying that. It's just the, what I'm looking at. But here's Viognier in the center. And Viognier, it, we don't know what its mother or father crossing is, but what we do know is that one of its parents is Mondus Blanche. And Mondus Blanche is a varietal from the Savoy region in kind of the Alpine area of France. And what's interesting about Mondus Blanche is that it is also one of the parents of Syrah. And when we talk about kind of famous uh, styles of wine, one of those famous styles of wines is the Cote Roti. In Cote Roti, the little translation is the roasted slope, which is where that video was taken. But classically, in Cote Roti, uh, the traditional blend is 60, or excuse me, 80% Syrah to 20% Viognier, or a maximum of 20% Viognier. And <laughs> Viognier, excuse me, Viognier and Syrah have always been kind of closely tied to each other. And so it's not uncommon that even in Texas and everywhere else around the world that we see these two varietals sometimes co-fermented together in the sense that they are varietals that uh, have always been together. And so typically where you can plant Syrah is also where you can plant Viognier. They like the same and similar climate. Uh, and obviously uh, they have a, a parent that is in common with them. All right, you guys, any questions about Viognier before we move on to the Ocotillo? Is it pretty significant that it's used so much in the making of red blends? Um, Rob is asking this, it, how significant is it in the, in the making of, of red blends, uh, particularly with Syrah, blending with Syrah. Um, it's interesting. You talk to some Texas wineries and they say that they, they use, they co-ferment with Viognier or they co-ferment with white wines because the belief is that that when color molecules bind with tannin molecules it it basically makes the wine a little bit more stable and it, it fixes color better um i've seen it used in a lot of gsms and just even straight grenache but not co-fermentation just as a blend just as blending blending yeah <clears throat> yeah i there was a research paper that i was reading actually before class started that talked about the question was does co-fermenting with Viognier or white grape skins help a fixed color? And they did a, a trial of, uh, the, the bin trial was 5% white grapes, 10% white grapes, 
20% white grapes. And they said that based off of that, there was no distinguishable difference between yeah. the darkness of color. But what about the other intangibles like stability of tannin, um, aromatic characteristic? Uh, obviously, if I blend a lower acid wine with Syrah that tends to be slightly higher acid, particularly from a cool climate, I'm going to reduce my overall acid and increase my pH. So I think there's some textural things there. Oh yeah. Um, but uh, the the really the the idea of blending or, or co-fermenting white and red, maybe that's just classic because they grow together. You know, I, I the history there and the and the story there is still kind of out. I'm I'm happy to be able to finally do this first virtual class with the wine club. I think it's going to grow. Uh, ever since we launched the new wine club, we've had nothing but really positive feedback from everybody in terms of the quality of the club, the value of the club, and the idea of creating more educational opportunities for people. So it's exciting to be able to introduce not only uh, new classes, but also new educators and new personalities to the family that we call the Venovia membership. And uh, we hope that it continues and we hope that you're having a good time and that you share it with people. Uh, there's no reason why you can't drink three wines with your buddies. You just need to invite them over or uh, I can invite them over for you and you may not know them. <laughs> so, guys, I really appreciate your time today. Look forward to uh, segments of this being on the website. Um, if you missed any of Julia's classes, all of those classes are currently on YouTube, except for the first class where we had some technical difficulties, but the wines on the Shades of Rosé class, the wines on the Republic of Georgia are all on there. And to kind of summarize kind of where we are today with the business, um, you guys are more than welcome to come here. Uh, we do have spots on the deck where you can be that are on non-permanent property. If you need to use the restroom when you come in here, you're more than welcome to use the restroom. But right now, TABC does not want us serving uh, any of the cocktails or by the glass, however you can buy the bottle uh, and hang out uh, on the non-permanent portion of the property. And we're trying to figure out how to make more non-permanent property possible on the deck uh, and possibly inside. And then if you haven't heard, the, the Friday meals have been doing really quite well where every Friday we're offering a different meal that comes with wine that you can either pick up or hang out and picnic with. Alrighty. I appreciate everybody's time. Thank y'all so much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. We'll see y'all soon. Ciao.